Linda. Yeah, that's Linda. Okay. And all right. All right. <laughs> that's my Bob. My Bob Belcher. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Drew. And I'm Olivia. And we are Oddly Curious. And we're back. We're back, baby! We're back! I know at least one of you probably thought they're never coming back. And maybe I was me. <laughs> but I was like, no, it's happening. I, I know. I was like, Drew, I'm so sorry that I keep canceling on you. But I knew I knew we'd get back to mm-hmm. it. Like, first, I was moving. And then... Your poor life became upended. I had COVID. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, things just kept happening. And then I actually got sick. Yeah. But it wasn't COVID. Yeah. It was just like life. And when you work full time, and this is like a hobby, even though you wish it could be your job, Mm -hmm. you just don't have time all the time. No, you don't. Mm -mm. But now we're back and hopefully better than ever. Yeah. (laughs) 2024 is is our year to um, podcast regularly. I don't know. Yes. I'm also going on a two week trip tomorrow. I know. Yeah. But we're going to... And I wish Olivia was coming with me. I'll preface, I'm like, she'll just be in my pocket. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you could, like, have a little, like, instead of a flat Stanley, like a little flat Olivia that you carry around. What if you did? <laughs> That'd be so okay, I need to do that. I need to have a picture of you. Okay. And be like, oddly curious trip. Oh. <laughs> Until our real one. Yes. Because that will happen. We're gonna, it like could be a like. A trip or something. Yes. And it could be like podcast themed but also we could just do it for fun mm-hmm. like we don't have to put the pressure on us but you know if something happens we're like oh that's interesting yeah what let's drive there i know we were just talking about i think a couple weeks ago we both want to do like kind of a southern gothic mm-hmm. like abandoned towns trip yes speaking of which i do have a shout out for mm-hmm. southern gothic abandoned okay um i think i sent this person to you before and they are uh oh my gosh <laughs> back to bob bob belcher oh, oh my gosh. gosh um he's a photographer i found him on tiktok and then i found him on instagram and of course i can't remember what his name is because i like why put that to memory when you can just be like there he is but then i can't find it <laughs> um i will have to find it for after the episode but it's kind of the vibe i was thinking of what we want to do okay because um it's just so cool. But at the same time, I'm like, I swear, some of these places look like they're in the Pacific Northwest, mm-hmm. which I think yeah. followers and listeners have figured out that's where we live. And I think they are. I think some people think it's Southern Gothic, but it's actually Eastern Washington and Eastern Oregon. Yeah. Sometimes like I'll think something is Southern Gothic and then it's like, oh, this is actually like on the coast. Or yeah. Something. But yeah. It turns out Southern Gothic is in your heart you it is find it where you want it southern gothic is like the friends we made along the way <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say if there's like a lot of abandoned churches or something. yeah which is like oh that didn't work out for you no something bad happened something bad happened here but and maybe it was just the plumbing maybe they just needed to do a remodel it, it could have just been that honestly yeah. they just moved into a different building yeah which that hopefully nobody died or anything but like searching for this guy i sent it to you one time i i believe you i just don't remember his name either (laughs) the problem is i've sent you so many things on instagram that it's like wading through this this sea of how many margot robbie and lana del rey pictures right yeah (laughs) i'm like what have i sent you (laughs) everything and i know i feel like there's just a few people that I'll send things to every day, and you are one of those people. Yeah, same with you. Yeah, so like... And it can run the gamut of today was a Metallica meme, which was really fun. Yes. Um, wait, did I find it? <gasps> did I? I did find it. Yes. Fresco Park is his name. So it's... Yes, I. At B, so it's B-R-I-S-C-O-E-P-A-R-K. Anyway, just yeah, it's so beautiful. So beautiful. Shout out to this guy for. Oh, well, that's scary. Oh god, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to go there. No, I don't want to go there. But everywhere else, it's like he he goes to places at night. He must feel safe. 
it's easier to do stuff like that as a guy, unfortunately. Yeah. But it's just kind of like the peacefulness of at night and you hear like crickets and frogs and it's just a little bit creepy, but it's safe at the same time. Yeah. Hopefully he's like not going by himself, though. Yeah. I'm like, I don't care who you are. If you're going by yourself in the woods, that's You're asking no for good. trouble. <laughs> And some people on TikTok have even asked him, are you by yourself? And he's like, yeah, I feel safe, which I'm like, is that just part of his narrative of, yeah, or does he really have no one with him? Also, the fact that you're saying that you're going by yourself, I'm like, if it was a woman, like, you can't tell someone you're going by yourself. No. Then you're... they might be plotting something bad. Yeah. <sighs> That's going to be... That... That this took, I was like, wow, <laughs> this took a dark turn. <laughs> well, uh, do you have like any recommendations? I mean, you kind of just did oh, yeah. one, but like podcasts or movies or anything that you've been listening to or watching? Yes, now I can't remember them. But what about you? Um, I do have a couple recommendations. So there's a book that I listen to and then also a podcast by the same person so i listened to uh it's called the art of keeping house while drowning by casey davis whoa and sounds good she's like a tiktok creator and she has a podcast called struggle care and she's a therapist but she also like kind of built up her um following during covid uh because she had just had a baby and she was like dealing with postpartum depression mm -hmm. during covid and she like her house was a mess like i feel like many of us our houses were a mess <laughs> right and she has good recommendations for like cleaning house and like setting up systems in your house that are helpful for you if like you have mental illness or mm -hmm. you're neurodivergent or have a oh, chronic well. illness <laughs> exactly <laughs> and uh yeah it's just been really helpful it's made it so it's easier for me to like tackle things around the house and i don't feel like i have to do a giant clean and like wear myself out you know yeah that's really good and um <laughs> it's funny we were actually talking about this earlier when i was like if something's not pretty just put a basket there i got that from her oh you did i oh. did but i mean i actually did do that before but i have like taken it to the next level of like if there's something I don't know where to put it, or if there's something that's kind of ugly, just mm -hmm. hide it in a basket. <laughs> hide it in a basket. Yeah. Just put put it in a basket. Kind of like my feelings. Exactly. And my wants and needs. But yeah, I highly recommend. I think everyone should read that book, but especially if like you have a really hard time due to illness or mental illness, you know. That sounds great. Yeah. So it's How to Keep House While Drowning? Mm -hmm. By Casey, like the letters K.C. Davis. Okay. Which is nice because um, even though we're not moms, we're still drowning because we also, yeah. like, your circumstances changed. I have to take care of everything, everything by myself. Mm -hmm. It's just like, yeah, just because you're by yourself doesn't mean you don't have a lot of responsibilities. Yeah. And like, I have a chronic illness my husband has adhd so we both have i like, have adhd yeah we but i'm not your husband no you're not no but you both have adhd uh -huh. you you guys share so, that in common but because you know that then it's like you can be kinder to the struggles or you recognize them yeah and like i'm also learning a lot more about adhd because this creator, she also has ADHD. Yeah. Maybe you can teach me something. <laughs> I feel like I'm constantly being like, oh, that's what that is. I'm like, just listen to Struggle here. Yeah, I'm going to do she it. She says it better than I ever could. So. Yeah. Um, I did find, though, there is one podcast I did start listening to. It is actually, oh, actually, I have two. But one is, a, it's really a hard listen, mm -hmm. but it's Voices for Justice. Have you heard of this one? That does sound familiar. Um. It is the girl, I'm going to, the problem is my brain just went blank when I thought of everyone's names. Is it Sarah Turney? Yes, Sarah yeah. Turney. Okay. And she's trying to get justice for her sister and her... Alyssa Turney. Alyssa her, and her terrible dad. Yeah. But then she has turned it into this platform of finding justice for other people mm -hmm. and... I, we've listened to a lot of true crime stuff. Like, yeah. stuff doesn't really, I mean, it will make me feel sad, of course, or just it makes you want to focus on 
the victim, which is what she's doing. But there was this one I listened to and she was like doing a wrap up of like the end of the year. These things were, f- they found the killer here or they, they got justice here. And I was driving to my parents' house, which is three hours away. And there was one thing she talked about. I don't know how she does it, but I started bawling. Oh, and it no. has, I've never had that kind of reaction before because usually I can compartmentalize it. And it's like, I want to, not that I want to hear grisly details. And she didn't give grisly de- details. It just hurt that much. Yeah. Like emotionally. And I was like, this girl is amazing. And she has nearly like perfect rating on Apple podcast which is like we all know how people are stinkers when it comes to oh totally yeah it's like the fact that she everyone is like no this is good anyway voices for justice it's a hard listen but it's kind of important just because it's like the stuff you've never heard about it's marginalized people marginalized women you know people of color um or a lot of children which Mm -hmm. is like that's what got me yeah Yeah. i was literally like oh my god I like, I actually had to turn it off and listen to silence for a while. Mm -hmm. I've never had to do that before. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I, I haven't listened to it yet, but I do, I follow Sarah on TikTok and like, she has a lot of updates about Alyssa's case. And then, um, I saw when you were showing me that, that she also had as a guest, um, Laura from the fall line. Yes. Right here. And I, I love Laura as well. She's so cool. That's Even a, her picture. She looks like I wouldn't mess with her. Yeah. That's another podcast. Like that is very yeah focused and like, um, I mean, it's literally the fall line. It's like the people who are left behind because yep. they're marginalized. Yeah. So also I should do a shout out to Chelsea, my, one of my besties. <laughs> Who? Chelsea. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're like, Chelsea. I know Chelsea. You know Chelsea, but she's the one that told me to listen to it. Good job, Chelsea. Yeah. Because she's always on the hunt for new things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because she's one of us. One of us. But the other thing, so we're going from dark and heavy to happy, is our mutual friends started their own podcast. <gasps> yes. And it's called Cozy. Ooh. Hold on. I was going to say the name wrong. Oh, oh I just did it Cozy. I was going to say Cozy Coffee Fall Date. And I was like, why does that sound wrong? <laughs> like Cozy Coffee Fall Date. Because I think you said the fall line. Oh, <laughs> oh, I got it in your head. Yeah. Cozy Fall Coffee Date, which is much nicer. Yes. Yeah. And it's just happy. With uh, our friends Jessica and Telly. Yeah. So give it a listen. It's like the things you love about fall. Pumpkin spice. Sweaters having fun things to do when it's cold outside just in general being cozy Mm -hmm. and they are both very good with their research yeah yeah research and being funny and adorable Mm -hmm. and like instant dopamine yes so cozy fall coffee date and if you have any kind of attention deficit you might mess up that name so (laughs) you know (laughs) Well, we can post our story. Uh, and also the other day, I was telling somebody at work about my podcast, and I said "curiously odd," and I was like, "Curi," like it. I was like, "curiously odd." I was like, "That's not right." And she's like, "Wow, that sounds so interesting." And I was like, "Oh, I'm sorry, it's oddly curious." And she was like, "Oh," I was like, "Wait, no, the the first one isn't the right one." You're like, "Did I just mess up my own?" Yeah, name? yes, I did. Yeah, I don't think curiously odd sounds. It sounds clunky. No, if if she thinks that's better, then she's wrong. Yeah, and. She's wrong. So, yeah. I mean, if you're listening, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, I won't name drop just in case she's like, hey, anyway. But, <laughs> and also thanks to all the people who are listening that stuck out our hiatus. Yes. I'm like, I know a few of our, our loyal followers that will be listening. Mm-hmm. But all two of you. Shout out to you guys. You guys, we love you and you. Thanks, mom. <laughs> my, my mom told me sometimes that the podcast makes her anxious, which I'm like, mom, I love you. I mean, me too. But I know. <laughs> I'm like, so I told her that this episode was going to be a little bit lighter. And oh, no, you lied. I was doing my research and I wanted to apologize to my mom just ahead of time. Mom, I love you. Don't listen to this episode. But or listen with discretion. Listen to my story, not Drew's. Yeah, <laughs> don't listen to the first one. And it's not like I chose it to to find something terrible. It's I think it's important to talk about. Yeah, but if like if you're sensitive, um, just 
Oh, and I guess, I mean, I will do a trigger warning before my story, but just so you know, I'm not doing any grisly details. No. I, I never will. So. Yeah, we never do grisly. Unless it's also the bear. bear. <laughs> <laughs> Someday we're going to have to do grizzly man. Yeah, or and maybe cocaine bear. I don't yeah. know. I just want to do grizzly man so I can do a Werner Herzog impression. Yeah. Oh, man. Grizzly man is grizzly, though. It is really grizzly. That is one where it's like, we won't do details because this is actually one of the things about living in the north western west part of north america where you have to be careful because um, i have a friend in australia where it's like australia is all about snakes and spiders and everyone's afraid of them and she's like but are you afraid of bears and i was like well we don't see them that often and then i thought about it if it came down to being eaten by a bear or seeing a spider that just runs across my bed that's the size of a yorkie terrier mm -hmm. i'm like of course i'm gonna pick the spider yeah i will choose poison over being torn to pieces yeah by a bear and it, the big spiders in australia aren't even the poisonous ones so it's yeah. kind of like they're, right? just, they're yeah. gonna hang out with you also i mean you're never gonna catch me far out enough in nature to be eaten by a bear though no so. no <laughs> that will never happen yeah where it's like because i mean australia is tough and they have to live with their big spiders every day. Yeah. But, I mean, I saw a TikTok the other day where a woman was sitting at her picnic table and she just had to sit and watch as the black bear ate her food because she was afraid to move. <laughs> Did you see that? She was like holding her son. And the bear like, was in her face like, is this really good? Did yeah. you try this? She she did great, though. She, she like was so calm. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to do that with spiders. No, you don't. I mean, sometimes I still stay still. but Yeah. <laughs> sometimes I'm brave enough to kill them and then sometimes they're too high up and I have to ask my tall husband to kill them. I so I try to save them. I'm one of those people. If they are not in the bathroom, I yeah. can't deal with them being in the no, bathroom. No, in the bathroom, you get flushed down the toilet. Yeah. I, no. One time I... <laughs> Did it climb back up? One time I woke my husband up in the middle of the night. <gasps> because it was in the bathroom? And it was so giant Ooh, like was it a wolf spider probably yeah it because like he came out and he was like oh wow like i thought you were exaggerating but that is really big and then like like he has his own zip code exactly and then the same week i saw the same type of spider at work and i was like why are you doing this to me yeah i think that is because we found one in the garage one time yeah and like it was big enough that i could see his eyes oh god <laughs> Which then I felt bad killing him because I was like looking in his eyes and I'm like, I'm sorry, this is for your own good. I know. <laughs> we were just talking about uh, Bob's Burgers, what makes me think of the episode where Louise tries to keep the spider in her room. Yeah, and then it goes missing. <laughs> yeah. And you're, it's like, it's oh. like her best friend. <laughs> there's a part of me that is like Louise. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. I would probably become emotionally attached to a spider and then mm -hmm. feel guilty i even saw one today at work and i just said hello to it and i noticed it look at me which was a little bit scary but i was like oh what if he's being friendly are spiders friendly i don't no, know i don't think they are i know every and like the few times who am i kidding it's more than a few times the times i've killed a spider yeah. it's always like a couple moments of an ethical dilemma yeah <laughs> because you know they do so good they in the do. world and i'm like i'm really sorry but you're in my home you don't want me in your home he's like yeah i do because you bring in they're like i want to eat you yeah <laughs> i don't know <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> if i'm oh no, my gosh if it was big enough to be inside a spider's home then i'd be like kill it like kill in, it all um a hobbit I think. yeah, yeah. <laughs> she lobe i remember reading that at school when you're reading about the giant spider in school and you're like Oh my gosh. Like, I realize this is fake. I like that you know the spider. <laughs> I do. I do. Why is that a spider? <laughs> because she's scary and you're the. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, like, give she loves some respect. It was just like at the top of your brain yeah. there. I'll never forget. Hashtag never forget <laughs> she lobe. Justice for she lobe. Actually, she was kind of a jerk. She's kind of a jerk, but at the same time, when you think about spiders, they're just trying to survive. She's like, I don't know what you are. I just need to feed my kids. Yes. Yeah. He's just trying to take care of herself. Exactly. She, she's a single mother. She's a single mother. She ate her husband. <laughs> she can't even get child support. 
Uh, <laughs> oh, that, that was pretty <laughs> uh, so, Well, do we want to get into our topic? Yeah, we should. Okay. Okay, so our uh, our theme for this episode is it was just going to be animal heroes or like heroic animals, but we both ended up doing dogs. We were going to actually do this. We did the same dog. <laughs> I know. And then I was like, oh, I'm glad I said something. Which is like, I was like, oh, no, I have this. I have this ready to go because this is something close to my heart. But as I was doing the research, I was like, this is devastating. But important because it's historical, and I think everyone should just know this happened. Yeah. Oh, boy. Here we so, go. Here we go. <laughs> and did I cry doing research about this? Yes. Get your get your tissues out. Yeah. Get your glass of wine, mm-hmm. everyone. We have ours. We have ours. Okay. So today I am going to tell you, Olivia, and everyone else who is listening about... Animals in space. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go. My sources are an Atlas Obscura article by Eric Grundhauser, a NASA article by Tara Gray, and a space.com article by Megan Bartels and Mike Wall, and then, of course, Wikipedia, Mm -hmm. which sometimes I will look at the the sources on Wikipedia, and it's the same sources of what I've looked up, (laughs) but... They do it in such a concise way. It's like almost like bullet points. Mm-hmm. Whereas like some articles are so well written, but they're very flowy that you're like, I'm trying to find a specific word and yeah, Wikipedia will just have it. So anyway, so as we have known humans to be, they are fascinated by all the things they can't do, which includes flying. I thought you were going to say they're terrible. <laughs> they're terrible. Oh, as we know humans to be, they're terrible. Yes. And they really want to fly. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like, have you ever thought about why, if you can't, try, why are you wanting to do this? Yeah, why <laughs> Why are we trying so bad? Right, and which I'm like, I'm happy for it, because then I'm going to go on a 14-hour flight on Sunday. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I'm thankful for that. But at the same time, it's like, why did we think we just stay in a boat? I know. Anyway, that's just my, my personal gripe. <laughs> um, but because humans have to create things to help them fly... They need test subjects first because they're not self-sacrificing. Because they're cowards. Yeah. And Sorry, scientists. Right. And so it just turns out for years, humans have been flinging unsuspecting animals into the sky. And one of the first instances, um, interestingly, was in 1783. The Montgolfier brothers in France, they were aviation pioneers and avid balloonists. Avid balloonists. <laughs> um, they wanted to test out a hot air balloon as a force, a force, a source of travel mm-hmm. from one place to the other, uh, which sounds whimsical and beautiful, but they were like, well, we could die. Where should we practice this with animals? Oh, the gardens of Versailles. <laughs> so with Marie Antoinette watching. Marie, our girl. Our girl Marie, friend of the podcast, Marie Antoinette. She was among the guests and I was like, of course she was there. That's her house. Like, so <laughs> yeah, I guess she would be. <laughs> like, if they didn't invite her, that would have been really awkward. Yeah. Um, so they watched this happen. The brothers, in order to test out this form of travel, um, they brought a rooster, a duck, and a sheep as test subjects. Interesting. Yeah. The only name I could find for these animals was for the sheep. His name was uh, Mont au ciel, which means climb to the sky in French. That's such a whimsical name I for know. sheep. I know. Oh, God. Right. And he was chosen because of his similarities to human physiology Mm -hmm. well okay turns out we're all just little sheep um yeah the duck was chosen because it already has the ability to fly at high altitudes and would act as a control and the rooster was a bird that never gets very high off the ground and would act as a comparative case for the duck and then it's like actually the rooster is just the person who's afraid of flying it's like you meet (laughs) someone on every flight that's like why are we doing this i gotta say this whole setup sounds like a riddle. It really does. <laughs> I'm like, so a sheep, a duck, and a rooster walk into a hot air balloon. <laughs> and um, so the balloon took off. 
uh, that morning with its precious cargo and sailed for about eight minutes. The balloon covered two miles or 3.2 kilometers for those who are smart enough to have the metric system. <laughs> and they obtained an altitude of about 1,500 feet. Um, for those first eight minutes, uh, it was great until it crashed landed in a small forest. The animals were fine. Oh, thank God. Okay. Right. Yeah. I'm like, not the bull sheep. They're I so know. Innocent. They're so innocent. You're actually going to love this. So okay. they were they were unharmed, except the rooster who had been kicked by the sheep. <laughs> he was fine. <laughs> like, get out of uh -huh. here. So after these brothers, like, invented this flying contra contraption, <laughs> of course, they started using humans as their experiment. Mm -hmm. um, and then the sheep and the duck and the rooster, they became minor celebrities. That's so, cute. so cute. They all went on to live great lives because they made aviation history. The sheep, in fact, was adopted by Marie Antoinette. I knew my girl was going to yeah. adopt him. Yeah. And uh, it said he lived the rest of his life eating candy and marshmallows in her sheepfold. So she's not great at knowing she's not that diet, but she was just, she loved him so much. She's like, you know what would be cute if this. She ate a marshmallow. Uh -huh. it looks like Is a marshmallow. Yeah, I bet that's what it was. Marie, I get you. I get you. Um, so of course, as time goes on, more forms of air travel is developed, like with um blimps. I forget the actual like, like that. What's that one word? A zeppelin. A zeppelin. <laughs> yeah. I'm like the one that's not a blimp. <laughs> the one that doesn't sound like a sandwich. Um, zeppelins, and then of course. Airplanes, and it's like, of course, there are instances of animals going on those. It's just not as like memorable, just because it's like people were on it. Of course, they have their little dog with them. Yeah. Eventually, so if you are wealthy enough at the time to travel, you might have a little dog with you. That's course, just, yeah. I mean, people are doing that to, today. So we're jumping ahead several hundred years from the Mont Golfiers with their balloon test, and we are in the 1940s. And it's now the space race. So uh, we're, they're like, I have, I'm sick of the sky. I need outer space, humans mm -hmm. said. The final frontier. The final frontier. So before humans could actually go into space, one of the prevailing theories about space flight was that humans might not be able to survive long periods of weightlessness. So for several years, there was this debate among scientists that the effect of prolonged weightlessness would affect humans negatively. And then American and Russian scientists were like, let's utilize animals, which, oh, I'm like, come on. Um, they just wanted to make sure that a living organism could survive space and come back alive and unharmed. Yeah. Well, and then there's like a little asterisk there or like the voice from, um, uh, like from Arrested Development. Arrested Development, yeah. He's like, that didn't happen. <laughs> they did not. They did not. Um, so when it came to living organisms, the U.S. started small. In 1947, they launched a um, German V-2 rocket that had been captured during World War II and had be, been refigured to become like a rocket that goes into space. And they put fruit flies on board. Oh. Yeah. And these V2s were such high tech. They were long range weapons that could fly at 3,500 miles per hour and hit targets standing as far as 200 miles away. Scientists, in addition to being learning about weightlessness, wondered, you know, if cosmic radiation would ex be a bad exposure to humans. So turns out fruit flies have a similar genome to humans mm -hmm. which it's like funny that you think that that's funny yeah um 75 percent of all disease causing genes present in humans have the same analogs in a fruit fly's genetic code mm -hmm. so they're like if this is going to affect a fruit fly it'll definitely affect a human <laughs> okay yeah in addition to the fruit flies they also had corn rye and other plants on board to just kind of see if anything was affected um so turns out fruit flies are really popular in the biological researching field because of this. And when they came back, they survived. Um, there were no effects of cosmic radiation. And I wrote, they were rewarded a banana. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, how do we pay these fruit flies? <laughs> they were having the best time of their lives. 
Um, so the first vertebrae sent into space were a series of ill-fated monkeys mm. and mice launched between, yeah, 1948 and 1951 by American scientists. For instance, one um, on June 14, 1949, a rhesus monkey named Albert II blasted at an altitude of 83 miles an hour. He survived the flight but died on impact. So it's like they're learning. They're like, they don't want these animals to die. That's yeah. the bottom line. But they're like, well, it could kill someone. And it's kind of like, maybe space isn't for us. I'm, yeah. I love it. It's beautiful. Maybe we just weren't meant to be there. Yeah. Maybe figure this out when you have better technology. Anyway, <laughs> that's my sidebar. Um, a year later, the U.S. launched a mouse and photographed its behavior in a weightless state, oh. but it was not recovered alive. Baby. I know. Now we're going to the Soviet Union. And it just gets more intense. It does, yeah. Um, first, they launched a pair of dogs, Saigon and Desik, 62 miles into the air, which was not quite space level. I think 66 miles into the air is considered space. But... They were recovered safely. This is in 1951. But throughout the rest of 1951, the Soviet Union launched so many dogs. It was just like, they're like, hey, it works. Let's keep trying. I'm not going into details because there were so many that were hit and miss of whether they survived or not. Mm -hmm. um, and then thankfully, the scientists working with the dogs were always devastated when they lost one. So it's, it was kind of nice to read that they're not heartless monsters. It's like they're yeah. they're in a communist government. They literally have someone making them do s stuff against their will. Like they're yeah. like, my family's going to get killed if I don't do this. Right. Yeah. So they just were like, okay. And then yeah. Yeah. So, I don't blame the scientists. I don't either. Yeah. So um, the only funny thing I found when doing research about this is that there was um, a stray dog that they were going to use named Bobic. What a cute name. I know. And she ran away. She's like, no. No. Right. So they found another stray to replace her, and they named her Zib, which was translated into substitute for a missing dog named Bobic. <laughs> <laughs> and then Zib ra ran away. So I was like, that's hilarious. Yeah. She's like, not today. So the U.S. and the USSR were keeping close tabs on each other as far as advancing space travel. And after Russia's first successful dog trip, which was those first two dogs, the U.S. launched and retrieved an anesthetized monkey named Yorick, along with 11 mice. And I forget which article, I should have written it down, but one of them said, alas, poor Yorick. Oh. <laughs> he died. And this is what is really heartbreaking. He survived the trip, but he died in his capsule overheating in the New Mexico sun, being oh, waited no. For rescue. Baby. And it's like, you guys didn't even think about that. Like, I seriously, uh, I'm like, the worst. Conducts heat. Yeah. And these in metal. I'm like, you think scientists would figure that out? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so then, May uh, 22nd, 1952, two Philippine monkeys, Patricia and Mike, <laughs> <laughs> along with uh, two white mice, Mildred and Albert. Sounds like they're on a double date. It does. Yeah. Are they living in like Coca Cabana or something? <laughs> right. um, I wish. Right. Um, these animals were the first to experience a period of weightlessness while also not dying. They returned safely and they lived comfortably after their venture into space, which is like, I guess that's the one nice thing about the animals that came back alive is they're like, thank you for your duty. Now go live a nice life. I wonder if the mice are like, oh my god, do you remember that time we were floating? Oh, oh god. What happened? And it's sad because it's like mice already don't live a long life. Mm -hmm. Like they're just like, a, a portion of their life was in space. And then monkeys, they're like, hey man, I can I can forget about this because I have so many snacks to eat for 20 years. Right. Um, okay. So because of this um, successful mission by the United States, the USSR stepped up their game which it's like okay come on russia's like hold my vodka yeah, yeah yeah they were um so we're getting to the star of the show is laika laika the first earthling to be launched and orbit the earth also known as the goodest girl that's what i wrote <laughs> the goodest girl 
Uh, so behind all of this, at the helm, is Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet leader. He's so desperate for a spacecraft to be launched on November 7th, 1957, because it's the 40th anniversary of the October Revolution when they overthrew the Tsarist autocracy. So it's like their, um, the anniversary of when the Bolsheviks killed children in cold blood. They're like, let's put something into space. It's like, and kill that. And yeah. kill that. But it's like, I wrote, why did he want to do this? Just Soviet leader things, I guess. <laughs> like, <laughs> Nikita, you're going in my burn book. I know. Uh, I don't really understand. He's like, to show that we're really successful, let's go into space. Yeah. I'm like, well, I don't no. know. I don't think that's going to work out well. So he gave scientists a deadline that was like right around the corner. Of course. Of course, because it's like. That always goes well. Uh huh. They were wanting to do it in 1958, and he's like, no, you have to do it November 1957. Because, of course. Of course, yeah. Um, because he wanted the world to see his engineers deliver a, quote, space spectacular. A mission that would repeat the triumph of Sputnik 1, which Sputnik 1 was the first satellite in Earth's orbit, which only happened in October of 1957. Mm -hmm. So this happened a month later. He's like, you need to put someone in space. Oh, my gosh. No. I, I'm like, the answer is no. Um, so, of course, if they were going to do it, they had to use a dog because that's what they had been using. Soviet rocket engineers had long intended a canine orbit, of course, for 1958, but now they had to move forward fast to satisfy Khrushchev's demands. So they did everything they could to make their November launch. So sweet little Laika, she was found as a stray wandering the streets of Moscow a few weeks before the launch. Soviet scientists chose to use Moscow strays since they assumed that such animals had already learned to endure conditions of extreme cold and hunger. They're like, let's make it worse for yeah. them. Like, sure. let's lure them into a false sense of security and then make them do things they don't um, want to do. So she was this, um, it was either 11 or 13 pound little female dog, a mixture of possibly husky or another Nordic breed, and then possibly Samoid and then some kind of terrier, which is so oh, cute. I bet she was so cute. So there are so many pictures of her and we'll have to share them on our Instagram. So everyone can cry. Yeah. Um, and she was approximately three years old, and um, baby. Soviet personnel gave her several little nicknames, including little Russian names for Little Curly, Little Bug, and Little Lemon. Oh, oh so oh. cute. And Laika is a translation for Barker because she barked during her radio interview. She was probably like, <laughs> she's like, get me out of here, get me out of here. And they're like, isn't she so cute? I like that they're like, isn't that crazy? She barked during her interview. Like, yeah, well, she's, she, she's, she's not answering questions. She's telling you, I don't want to do this. Two other dogs were also in the running to be in Sputnik 2, just in case Laika did not work out. And one of them, Albina, they didn't want to use because she had just had puppies. Mm. Like, they were literally taking female dogs that could be mothers and being like time to go into space well i mean i guess i'm glad they didn't separate her from her puppy yeah that was nice okay so there were two parts that made me a little sad um this one is before the launch of the mission scientists took like a home to play with their children uh, dr vladimir yadovsky said quote Laika was quiet and charming i wanted to do something nice for her she didn't have much longer to live they're like, let's get our children attached to the yeah. dog. Yeah. That's great. So Laika was the test dog on a one-way mission into space. Albina was um, the backup dog. She had actually already flown twice in high altitudes, and she became a mother. I'm like, go queen. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the third dog, Mushka, was the control dog, and she was to stay on the ground and be used to test um, instrumentation and life support. Which, whatever that means, I don't know. Yeah. According to a NASA document, Laika was placed in the capsule of the satellite on the 31st of October, 1957, three days before the start of the mission. So she had to be in her capsule for three days without being able to move. And at that time, it was really cold in Russia. So they had to 
uh, keep her area warmed with um, like warm water. So mm-hmm. at least she was comfortable and she had a lot of food. Like she was well groomed even and they like like would paint iodine on her so they could play sensors, but they made sure she was at least comfortable. Mm-hmm. One of the technicians preparing the capsule before the final liftoff said, quote, after placing Laika in the container and before closing the hatch, we kissed her nose and we wished her bon voyage, knowing she would not survive the flight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it makes me sad because it seems like the scientists were really sad about but, it. Yeah. I don't know how they could sleep at night. They, I would just be sorry. I would just be like, this is why they invented vodka in this country. I mean, also, I would... I would steal her if yeah. it was me. Yeah, but... just go on the run. Yeah. And be like, me and Laika against the world. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> be so cute. Oh. Okay. So, she went up with no provisions made to return. Um, and this sparked a debate over in the West over the ethics of sacrificing animals to advance science. Because at least the United States, they always gave, I mean, even if they... It didn't work out. They always had the plan that it would come back, even for their fruit flies. We're like, if there's one thing the U.S. is going to do, it's going to be obsessed with our animals. Yes. I mean, it's like that is that is like a fine line that the U.S. won't cross. Yeah. Um, But the Soviet thinking is not the same, which is very sad. Yeah. Um, so, of course, so she did not return. And this at least gave them more information on what to do next. So Soviet Sputnik 5 in 1960 had a very successful mission carrying two dogs, Belka and Stroka. And they recovered after orbit. And the following year, despite Cold War tensions, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev gave one of Stroka's puppies to young Caroline Kennedy. And they named her Pushinka. Eventually, she gave birth to four of her own puppies, and John F. Kennedy referred to her or referred to them as the Pupniks, oh, which is cute. That is cute. That's and a I, dad joke. It, totally. And then I looked it up, and the Pupniks are—they're all given to like. I mean, people really wanted them mm-hmm. because, again, Americans are obsessed with their animals. True. And they—I think for one of them, there was like a drawing or like you like little kids just wrote in a letter of why they wanted one of the puppies. And I think Mm -hmm. one of the puppies ended up in like Iowa Mm -hmm. or something and just lived its best life. Just frolicking through the corn. Yeah. (laughs) Not knowing how it came there because of its ancestors. Yeah. Um, So NASA was founded in 1958, which I didn't realize it was, that's not that long ago. Mm -mm. Um, And despite them being more prone to being careful with animals, of course, they also, had their ups and downs, but from 1958 to 1961, they had used hamsters, mice, monkeys, and pigs, and surprisingly, most had a successful return. One in particular in January of 1961 was a champies named Ham. (laughs) Ham, (laughs) that's cute. It is an acronym for the Holloman Aeromed. I think it's Holloman is like either where he was stationed or the rocket he was in, um, but he was the first chimpanzee in space aboard the Mercury Redstone rocket, and he was on a suborbital orb- flight. So he just went up there, and he was great. He's really adorable. He's really mm. cute. There's a picture of him and Alan Shepard holding hands. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's cute. Yes. So Ham performed so well during his flight that um, – He even recovered quickly. He had splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean 60 miles from the recovery ship, and he was weightless for six minutes during a 16-minute flight. And a post-flight medical examination found that he was only slightly fatigued and dehydrated, but in good shape. And this paved the way for um, Alan Shepard to be the first human astronaut in uh, May of 1961. So just like four months later, he was that is in space. Cool. I think at this point, humans were like, enough with the animals already. Like, yeah. this is our goal. Just put me up there. Yeah. So um, after his successful flight in space, Ham went to 
a comfortable zoo where he spent the rest of his life. And then he was um, laid to rest in front of the Space Hall of Fame in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Oh. In 1983. Like, he lived a long life. That is a long mm-hmm. life. I'm like, that's almost right before I was born. Um, October 18th, 1963. So just as a sidebar, the French were like, let's get ourselves in the running here. <laughs> They were the only country outside of the USSR and the U.S. to even join the space race. They mm-hmm. were just wanting to kind of do it for fun. I They're think. like, oh, whatever. Which is so French of them. Say love you. Because this is what is so French of them. They were the first and only people to launch a cat into space. Oh, my gosh. And the cat survived. Good job, French people. Uh-huh. And her name was Felicité. And she is so cute. She was a tuxedo, long hair. I love every single thing about that. Yeah. Though. They literally were like, we did it. We all could have cat into space. They're like, let's close up shop, everyone. The we, French are like, <laughs> we de- proved that we could do it better than you guys. And we're out. <laughs> and then we, we used to cat. <laughs> um, so Felicite um, was a Parisian stray that was one of 14 cats trained and only one chosen. And it, thankfully, it was like, once France did this, they were like, well, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, and she went off to be really famous, like, in French-speaking, um, like, African countries, they used her face on stamps. It was just oh, adorable. God, I love France. Yeah, and then, of course, anytime an animal goes into space, anyone who has, like, all the money is like, I need that animal. So, like, she lived in luxury the rest of her life. I'm just imagining her, like, the cats from Aristocats. Totally, <laughs> yeah. I like that she sounds like she was... Like, Legally Blonde, where she's like, like what? Like, it's hard? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Okay, so over the course of the next few decades, many different creatures went into space, including in 1973 in the U.S., two garden spiders, Uh Arabella and Anita. Those are very cute names. Very cute names. They uh, successfully spun webs... And this gave scientists the opportunity to study webs that were created in low or no gravity, which I'm like, I don't know why they'd want to know that. I don't know. Why not? <laughs> right? But it like they were different. They were um, thinner in some places and thicker, which was unusual because on Earth, they're all uniform. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, the spiders were like, and I wonder if it's just because of no gravity. They had to. Anyway, what scientists learned is spiders, they know what they're doing. Yeah. They're like little arch. Little tiny architects of scary. They are very smart. They are. I actually wrote, not sure what they learned from this, but I'm sure it was something. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So over the years, as human space travel became more commonplace, thankfully, animal space travel slowly discontinued. By the mid-90s, NASA finally, which is the mid-90s, come on. NASA finally started to heavily question the ethics of using animals for research. They're like, are we terrible are we the problem (laughs) like no it must be russia that's the problem (laughs) um so at least for space testing of course for animal testing but throughout the 90s 2000s and 2010s many organized organisms not human were still launched into space but they were like 99 percent of them were insect related Mm -hmm. however in 2018 spacex um, Elon Musk's space company, I yeah. guess, <laughs> um, launched from Florida carrying 20 mice. They launched on June 29th and arrived at the International Space Station on July 2nd. And this was a record-breaking journey. It's the longest mice have been off-planet and survived. Hmm. Um, I just have to say, yeah, one of the many reasons on my list that I don't like Elon is the 20 mice he yeah. put into space. I don't like you, Elon. They were like, hey, you just gave us another reason to not like you. Yeah. Anyway, continue. Yeah. Um, and this apparently was part of a study to show how Earth dwellers' uh, physiology and sleep schedules would respond to being in space. And I'm like, you already know it's not good. Why do you need mice to tell you that? <laughs> yeah. Did you get a good night's sleep, little mouse? And he's like, oh, my God, I had the worst dreams. <laughs> Where am I? Um, Okay. And then finally, the latest launch record was June 3rd, 2021, SpaceX again, because SpaceX is not NASA. And NASA's like, 
hey, we decided to not do this, but... And Elon's like, I'll do whatever I want. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to buy NASA. Don't buy NASA. Don't get that idea. No, please don't. Don't. Um, so they launched Water Bears. What? How you know those, like, they're, like, target grades? I forget the term for it, but they're, like, the hardiest little creature. They can live in the vacuum of space. I did not know that. I'll have to show you a picture. They're a little freaky looking, mm-hmm. but they are... Like, they can be frozen for thousands of years and still be alive. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Like, hold on. This is worth noting. A, a water bear in space. Oh. Have you ever seen those? Yes, I have. They're like, tiny, tiny, tiny. Interesting. Weird things, but they are just doing something. They're micro animals. I don't know. I should know more about them. I don't know what they do. That's interesting, though. Yeah. So, in addition to the water bears, they also sent... Hawaiian bobtail squid oh. to the International Space Station, and the squid were launched as hatchlings and will be studied to see if they can incorporate their symbiotic bacteria in their light organ while in space. I don't know what any of that means. Me either. In fact, it sounds like a lot of baloney. It does. I'm like, I don't think they want to do anything about their light organ in space. <laughs> Did you even ask them? <laughs> they, they said no. Um, so, to wrap it all up, I'm going to Give you a quote from NASA, to because NASA is going to try and make you think that this is all for good. Okay. Over the past 70 plus years, American and Soviet scientists have utilized the animal world for testing. Despite losses, these animals have taught the scientists a tremendous amount more than could have been learned without them. Without animal testing in the early days of the human space program, the Soviet and American programs would have suffered great losses of human life. These animals performed a service to their respective countries that no human could or would have performed. They have given their lives and their service in the name of technological advancement, paving the way for humanity's many forays into space. I, boo! I like that they're like, you know, if we hadn't tested on animals, then humans would have died. What if you just didn't go into space? Yeah. Like, that was always an option. I think there's some guy out there that'd be willing to go into space despite the oh i'm sure uh-huh yeah I'm some guy that's like yeah i'm gonna tell you something you're gonna put me in space i'm gonna do it <laughs> <laughs> um, and i guess each of like these like ham Leica, and felicite mm-hmm. they all each have their own statues in their respective countries mm-hmm. and then i was reading about how Ham had his own. Leica, of course, had their own because it turns out in like 2017, Russia felt so guilty about what they did to Leica that they had they basically wrote a formal apology. Good. I mean, it took you a long it took time. Took you a long but... time. Um, so they gave her her own statue, but the French were like, "How do we not have a statue of Felicité?" So they actually made a GoFundMe for it and in 2017 i believe they also like erected it and the guy who started it he was like this is one of the things that shows the internet is a good place because literally she deserved this and we made it happen because of people that is around the world so anyway that's to um wrap up one of the saddest things we've had to talk about and i hope i did them justice i think you did yeah thank you i'm like sad but also angered angered yeah but also i like learning about cute little animals i'm glad felicite was okay and had a good life and ham and ham i just you know justice for Leica. yeah Leica makes me feel so sad i know also just like imagining them giving her a little kiss i know like that just breaks my heart at least what i hope is that she was warm and comfortable she like had all the food she wanted she was very snug She got kisses on her nose, and I think she might have just gone to sleep. Yeah. So that's what I hope. I hope so, too. Yeah. Okay. Well, do you want to take a short break before I do mine? Yes, I do need a breather for a second. That's good. All right. So it's time for my story. Yes. And don't worry, listeners, there is no dog death in this story, so it's okay. It's just the story of a very good boy, Mm. and this good boy's name is Togo, the... Um, well, I'll just tell you the story of Togo. Okay. <laughs> You're like, Togo, the amazing dog. I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to tell you anything yeah. about him yet. I can't wait. So my main sources were uh, the American Kennel Club had a great 
article called The True Story of Togo, and that was written by Will Hank, and then, of course, Wikipedia. And that was pretty much all I needed, because yeah. they were so detailed. So, here we go. So, first, we're going to start with Togo's or. <laughs> His orange story? His owner. <laughs> We're going to start with his owner. Oh, sure. <laughs> so his owner's name was... Um, Willem Dafoe. <laughs> we wish. He should be he Willem Dafoe. Yeah. He needs to be played by Willem Dafoe. But he was played by Harrison Ford, right? Yes, he was played by Harrison Ford. And I will get to the movies and everything soon. So just preemptively, listener, if you watch the movie, put Willem Dafoe's face over Harrison Ford. I've never said that sentence before in my life. Yeah, that's... A weird sentence. That is weird We're like, don't look at Harrison Ford. I'm like, at Willem I'm Dafoe. like, I've never been told to not look at Harrison Ford. I feel weird about it. <laughs> okay, so the his owner's name was Norwegian-born Lenhard Seppola, and he first arrived in Alaska in 1900. And when he arrived there, most sled dogs were Alaskan Malamutes. And Seppola began making a name for himself as one of the strongest mushers in Nome, Alaska. And for those that don't know, mushers are the ones that are, like, the humans that are telling the dogs how to go, like, mm. on the sled. Kind of like a conductor of a... Kind of, yeah. The dog conductor. They're like the trainer, yeah. basically. Um, around that time, Siberian Huskies were brought to Alaska by Russian fur trader William Gusak, and in the summer of 1909, English musher Fox Ramsey, which is a great name. That is a great name. Imported 60 Siberians to know. I think he was in X-Files. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a... I almost said really? <laughs> like, uh, wow. I'm special. <laughs> it's estimated that Togo was born in 1913 to a dog named Dolly. Oh, no. Dolly the mom I dog. know. She's so cute. Apparently, she was a very good breeding dog. Oh, poor Dolly. I know. She's, she's like, 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 tired of these kids. They don't want to keep having babies. Yeah. Maybe she liked it. I don't know. Yeah. Togo was named after... Heihachiro Togo, a Japanese admiral who fought in the war between Russia and Japan, and Togo was dark brown with cream, black, and gray markings, and he had ice blue eyes. Mm. He was very cute. We have lots of pictures that we're going to post with this pic- uh, with this episode because he was just so cute. And Maybe like just a Togo collage. It will. I'm like, look at his cute face. Togo! <laughs> and as a puppy, Togo suffered health problems. So Seppola gave him up for adoption because he didn't think that he could use him mm. as one of his uh, musher dogs. So uh, he gave him up to a nice family. However, little Togo threw himself through a plate glass window <gasps> And escaped back home. So Seppola figured he was stuck with the dog and he kept him. <laughs> that is intense. He's, Togo. He's like, you will not give me away. I can't even throw myself through a plate glass window as a human. And he was just a little puppy. Wow. He's a baby. He was proving his strength. He was. He's like, I am cantankerous. <laughs> As Togo grew, he loved to watch the working sled dogs, but he was too young to be in the harness. But he would often get loose and run alongside the sled dogs anyway. So Seppola finally relented and put a harness on eight-month-old Togo and hooked him up to the team, which I wish there was pictures of that, because I bet that was so cute. It would be, so, be like a 80s montage where it was just like a fun song playing. and It's like Rocky, but yeah. with yeah. Togo. Yeah. Best. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's Karate Kid. Yeah. <laughs> karate, He's so a karate Kid. Yeah. So little eight-month Togo ran 75 miles the first day in his harness, and Cephala finally realized that he had found the perfect lead sled dog. Over the years, Togo became known for his tenacity, strength, and intelligence. Togo and Cephala became inseparable. And during this time, Seppola won the All-Alaska Sweepstakes, which was a mushing competition in 1915, 1916, and 1917, with Togo being the lead dog. And then we're getting to what Togo and Seppola are famous for. Mm. So in the winter of 1925, a deadly outbreak of diphtheria spread in Nome, Alaska, Children were especially at risk for the disease, but due to the isolation of Nome, getting them medicine was very difficult. I really want to be like, could they get it? 
gnome way. Is that terrible? <laughs> gnome way home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, that's it. You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> um, they did have an antitoxin, but the nearest they could get it by rail was a town called Nanana. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I'm sorry. It sounds good to me. It sounds cute. <laughs> Which was 674 miles from Nome. So that really that's didn't get really it. far. Remotely oh my close. gosh, that's so far. That's like when you're in California driving to LA and you're like, I'm so close to LA. I can feel it. And then it says... Los Angeles, 674 miles. Oh, gosh. I know. It takes forever. And you're like, to LA. That's it. I'm turning around. <laughs> Why did my brain go, LA? LA. 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 <laughs> you're like, I'm on the five. I got to take on exit. <laughs> sorry, Togo. Okay. Sorry, Togo. We're going to get to your story. Yeah. There was also a blizzard, so traveling by air was mm. impossible. So officials decided on sled dogs. By the time of the outbreak, Seppala was 47 and Togo was 12, so both were a bit old and considered oh. past their prime. Why but... is it like the NBA? I know. <laughs> I mean, like, like not old by any other standards, but by their standards, they're like, oh. Man. I mean, for a dog, that is That's old. old. Yeah. But, like, 47, that's yeah. not old. No. <laughs> Uh, locals knew that Seppala and Togo were their best chance, so they recruited them anyway. On January 20th, Seppala and his 20 best dogs set out for Nome to retrieve the serum. Seppala's team and the westbound team, led by Henry Ivanov, nearly missed each other, but were able to make the trade because this was kind of a relay situation, and there were several teams of mushers and sled dogs, mm. but um, Seppala and his team by far traveled the greatest distance because they were the most experienced. Um, on the ice... Sorry, I can't talk. No. On the return trip, the team became stranded on an ice floe. Seppala tied a lead to Togo and tossed him across five feet of water. Togo attempted to pull the floe with the rest of the team on it, but the line snapped. Togo, being a very smart and good boy, mm. I put that in myself, Yes. and an amazing lead, snatched the line from the water and rolled it around his shoulders like a harness and pulled the team to safety. He's so smart. He's such a smart and good what boy. What the heck? I know. I don't know if people could figure that out. No, seriously. And, like, he would have to have such quick reaction time. Strength and, yeah, smarts. Pulling 19 other dogs and a grown man. <laughs> It's crazy. It's crazy. It, and it's almost like that sounds fake. Like, what if you wrote that into, like, a screenplay, they're like, yeah. They're like, come on. That's a little. Come awesome. on. Yeah. And Togo's like, no, this is very real. Yeah. <laughs> Seppala's like, that's my boy. That's my boy. <laughs> that's my plate glass boy. <laughs> <laughs> that's so <laughs> Seppala and his team made the handoff in Golovin. And the final stretch of the relay was led by Musher Gunnar Kossin, who had chosen Balto, who is often thought of as the hero of this story. Mm -hmm. And actually, Balto was from Seppala's kennel, but Seppala had not chosen him because he thought that he was not ready to be a lead. I have a question. Yes. Are Balto and Togo related? They are not. Oh, interesting. I know. I thought... I mean, if they are, it wasn't Very mentioned distant. anywhere okay. here, but this article is, like, super detailed, so I think if they yeah. were, yeah, it would have been mentioned. mentioned. Okay. Also, did you ever watch the movie Balto? Yes. Okay, yeah, I watched that when I was a little kid, and then when I found out that he was not even the one that the, did the majority of the trip, I was like, what the heck? I'm like, why is this not about Togo? That's a lie. <laughs> I know. It's... Wasn't Charlie Sheen his voice or something? Oh, God, I don't know. Who was remember. the voice of Balto? Oh, we need to look this you up do, real because quick. it might be like this may, This rings true. Oh, that'd be so sad. Is it Christian Slater? It's got that vibe. Uh, let's see. Balto. I haven't seen it in so long. We need to do like a justice for Togo. We do. I guess Disney did just make a live action. They did. Kevin Bacon. <laughs> oh, it's so wrong, but it's a little bit. And I remember I was like obsessed with the girl. Me dog too. She was so beautiful. Anna. And I was played by Bridget Fonda. Oh my gosh. Anyway. Jenna. Yeah, I was like, I wanted to be that girl dog. <laughs> Me too. I was like, I want to be a girl dog in 
um, Alaska in the turn of the century. I'm like, why is so specific? <laughs> why is that dog so pretty? <laughs> so pretty. Okay. Um, so back to back to Balto. So February 3rd, 1925, uh, Kaysen and Balto ride into Nome. And the lead dog, Balto, who finished the last 53 miles, gets more fame and recognition. And uh, many say that it was Seppla and his lead, Togo, that were the true heroes. Togo did an impressive 264 miles compared to the average 31 miles of the <gasps> other teams. 261 miles? Yeah. And they, did Balto get the... I don't know. Right. I think it's just because they were the ones that finished it up. Oh, I see. So probably when they got there, there was like, I imagine, news people, mm-hmm. reporters. And it's not like now where you can get news on demand. And it's not like they're like, Togo was here first. Yeah. They're like, this might have just been Balto. And I'm sure, you know, like they're all doing this to try and help sick kids so i'm sure seppel is not like hey it was my dog you know? why and it's also i keep like attaching human personalities to these dogs they're dogs yeah they're literally not even caring that someone thinks someone did something better than them yeah togo's like i'm just doing my job he's like <laughs> he's like i just really like running yeah <laughs> he's like who's balto <laughs> he's like sniffs him and he's like oh yeah i recognize that smell or he's gonna be like i don't even know him he doesn't go here. No, he does. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so in uh, the years following the rescue mission, Seppala traveled to New England and took on uh, local teams in a dog race. And even though Togo was 12 years old, he might have been older at this time, he was in the lead and they triumphed during togo's last race and beat the other team what yeah and he he did not die right after that he oh. just retired because he was 12 because <laughs> in like a movie he would just collapse in right Seppala's arms but no because Seppala is a good owner so he just realized that it was time for him to retire mm-hmm. and then um when he was 12 Seppala and Seppala wasn't 12 <laughs> I know this the way that it sounded like Seppala was. It was so <laughs> the strongest preteen we've ever met. <laughs> they made him real different back then. They did. Um, when Togo was twelve, Seppala and New England musher Elizabeth Ricker opened up a kennel in Poland Spring, Maine, where Togo lived out the rest of his years. And Togo was put to rest at the age of sixteen in nineteen thirty-two. Which for like wow for a dog even now yeah for a dog now That's and also like physical. for the breed for his yeah. physical job because usually dogs like that like I know anything about dogs you're like and I'm like well my experience is <laughs> no I don't really know anything but I do know if dogs are a working class don't they kind of like make their heart tired because. I don't know. You're like asking that's, the wrong Yeah, person, I just but... I just remember like learning about that. My first job was at a dog kennel. So I had to learn about Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. Um so like we learned about how um Great Danes, for instance, they don't live very long because their heart tires out. Oh. So dogs that have a lot of power, it's like they want to keep living, but their body's like, I'm so to- I'm so tired. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Like a lot of times bigger dogs, like they don't last as long mm. but maybe huskies are just resilient maybe 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 they're built different in the 1930s i don't know <laughs> hashtag built different yeah. <laughs> he was built he different. Was. <laughs> and then um Seppala himself passed away in 1967 at the age of 89 wow and as for his thoughts on togo and the great race Seppala spoke about it in an unpub- unpublished autobiography he said Afterwards, I thought of the ice and the darkness and the terrible wind and the irony that men could build planes and ships. But when Nome needed life and little packages of serum, it took dogs to bring it through. Oh, I know. So sweet. I I also really wish his uh, autobiography had been published because I'd be really interested to read that. But there isn't one? Uh, Not that I've seen. Yeah. Maybe... I don't know. There's just one written in Norwegian. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. Maybe his family just didn't decide yeah, to release it. Balto, who is, uh, you know, considered the hero, he earned a statue in Central Park. And for years, Togo didn't get the recognition that he deserved. But he 
received his own statue in Seward Park in New York City in 2001, and he also got his own movie on Disney+, Plus, and it starred his own descendant, Diesel, <gasps> playing Togo. His own descendant. Okay, okay, I have to watch the movie now. Have you watched it? I haven't. Because I, for some reason, I was worried because it has dogs in it, and that mm-hmm. makes me sad. Not like I just did a sad dog. Right. <laughs> but I think since I know the dog survived, maybe I should just do it. I know, and I would love to see his uh, descendant. descendant, and plus Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford. And he was also recently featured in the uh, American Kennel Club Museum of the Dog Exhibition, Mush, a tribute to sled dogs from Arctic exploration to the Iditarod. And he... <laughs> He is also on display. Oh, his body? <laughs> Where? Yeah. I, I think it's in Alaska. Yeah. That would be interesting. But um, that's a little weird. Right? I feel kind of weird about that personally. But if that's your thing, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I saw. So one time I went to Amsterdam and we went to the Rijksmuseum and mm-hmm. there was a horse there on display, like a real horse from the Napoleonic era. Mm hmm. And he had a really interesting name and a life, but it was so weird to see a real horse that was just there. Yeah. And hundreds of years old. Yeah. That's, I'm like, I would rather just imagine him alive and well. And there's also, I, (laughs) when I was researching, I almost started crying because there's this really cute picture I'd actually had pinned to my Pinterest for a while of Togo and Seppala. And then in the article I was reading, it said, Seppala bidding a final farewell to his beloved dog. And I was like, oh gosh, (laughs) that's right in the heart. I know. Dogs really are the best. I know. As much as I love cats, I don't think a cat would ever care enough to run 600 miles. No. They they show their love in other ways. They do. But, yeah, I can't, I don't know. Who am I going to say? Maybe a cat has done that. I feel like cats are like, Oh, you need to have that done today? (laughs) They're like, let me just lay down and lick myself. Yeah, they're like, let me think about that. But yeah, I can't wait to post pictures because Chogo has the sweetest little face. It's going to be like the episode of The Goodest Boy and the Goodest Girl. I know. Chogo and Laika. I hope they're... Friends forever. (laughs) I hope they're on the rainbow bridge together. They are. (laughs) And Togo's a lot older than her, but I feel Mm -hmm. like if they were in the same era they would have been friends yeah also this is sort of related to the story but not but the other day i was like do you ever like hear a sound on tiktok and you're like i don't know what that's from so i'm gonna like click on the sound yeah i made that mistake Uh oh because it was a sound from the movie all dogs go to heaven (laughs) no which i never watched as a child you never know myself no don't do it because i was like i like dogs and then i was like Oh, and Charlie Sheen's in it. That's where I got yes. the voice from. What if the dog's name is Charlie? Oh, is it Charlie Sheen? I don't know. We can look it up the dog's it. name is Charlie. Yes. And he's like going to the little girl and he's yeah. like, I'm just coming to say goodbye. And she's like, where are you going? And I'm like, oh, oh gosh. gosh. Oh, gosh. Now I need to see. But yeah, just that movie. I don't know what it is about children's movies in the 90s. It was all about, we're going to rip out your heart. Seriously, they just wanted us to cry all the time. They're like, here are your abandonment issues. <laughs> it's not remotely Charlie Sheen at all. I don't even like Charlie Sheen. Why do I... Who is it? It's Burt Reynolds. Wow. It's going to be more different. I like it even more now, because I just imagine it with a mustache. Well, I love Burt Reynolds. I love Burt Reynolds. I we're putting this out here first. We love Burt Reynolds. Also, I was just watching Golden Girls the other day, and they're all excited to meet Burt Reynolds. And at the end, like Burt Reynolds comes to the house and is like, "I'm, I'm, I'm here to pick up Sophia," <laughs> because they didn't believe her, right? Yeah, they're like, "That's nice, Sophia." Yeah, and Golden Girls is such a comfort. It is. I'm like, watch that instead of All Dogs Go to Heaven. Also, real talk, Pedro Pascal is current Burt Reynolds in his face. Oh my gosh, totally. Right? <gasps> yes. Because I saw a trailer for a movie, I don't even remember which one it was, but I was literally like, that is Burt Reynolds. And He's then was, got like the mustache yeah, and everything. Yeah, and I was yeah. immediately like, well, I am interested. Yeah. Color me interested. He's like one of the few old Hollywood actors that I feel like I haven't heard 
I'm like, please don't tell me if you've heard anything bad. Because I haven't heard anything bad about Burt Reynolds. I haven't either. Just the classic 70s stuff where people probably smoke and drink. Yeah. And maybe but, cheat on their spouses. I hope not. Probably not. I haven't heard anything creepy. Yeah, I nothing creepy. Yeah. yeah. That's the... Yeah. That's the real thing, isn't it? Yeah. But anyway, that's wow. the story of sweet, sweet boy Togo. I'm really glad you ended on that one. Because that was... Too much happier you know i was like <laughs> i think i sent you the gif of like tobias on rest of development like crying, crying in the sh- yes <laughs> that's exactly it and that was me like even though there's like nothing sad in the story i was like he's just such it's a good so boy good. It's so pure I know. that was me at work so like having to help patients in between like rereading my research mm-hmm. and being like oh my gosh why am i doing this to myself yeah well <sighs> Do we have anything else to say before we go? Um, well, I do have one thing to say. Okay. Is that Togo's story, it shows how humans and animals, if they work together, it can be really good. Yes. And that I think humans are supposed to take care of animals, mm-hmm. especially if you've domesticated them. I think that's your responsibility. Exactly. But it don't abuse animals abilities because they don't have a way of advocating for themselves yeah if you if you're out there and you do anything to animals we're gonna come and kick your butt yeah we're like don't even do it don't even think about it we're like liam neeson we have a special set of skills yeah (laughs) we're liam neeson only when it comes to animals yeah (laughs) for humans we're like man i wish i could do something i don't have i can actually can do cpr (gasps) yeah (laughs) yeah you're like, that won't help beat anyone up, but I can resuscitate Yeah, someone. Yeah, but that's yeah. about it. And um, if you're going to watch a movie with animals, look it up on doesthedogdie.com. Yep. That is important. Yep. I have used it before. Yeah. And I'm going to watch the Harrison Ford um, Togo movie where Harrison pl- plays Willem Dafoe. <laughs> <laughs> We should have a movie night. We and should. Watch that. Yeah. And let's not watch All Dogs Go to Heaven. Oh, no. No. I, I simply can't. Except it's Burt Reynolds. Man, that makes me so happy. We can watch something else with Burt yeah. Reynolds. Smokey and the Bandit. Yeah. Goes to Heaven. I also, <laughs> I also don't want to watch Deliverance. Oh, my gosh. Don't even look that up. Don't look that up even on anything. No. Just make sure you don't know anything about Deliverance. Also, I haven't watched it either. I've just listened to a movie podcast talk about it. So, I just know that so many people who were alive as adults in the 70s, like my poor dad, for instance, just went and saw it because it's like... It's Burt Reynolds. It's Burt Reynolds in a movie. Yeah. And then you're in it and you're like... What, what's happening? I got to get out of here. Also kind of insane, like, how for years I heard it referenced, like, in a joking way. Yeah, not funny. And then when I heard what actually happens in the movie, I'm like, I am sorry? What? Yeah. But don't use this as an excuse to look anything up. No. If anything, look up pictures of Togo. Yeah. Look at Togo and Willem Dafoe. Mm-hmm. And Harrison Ford. And Burt Reynolds. And Burt Reynolds. <laughs> But not all dogs go to heaven. But don't look up animals in space. It'll make you feel sad yeah. inside. Okay. And, well, that's all for me. That's all for me, too? Yeah. We'll see you next time, which will be really soon. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye.